Hello, welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We have another very packed episode. Well, we always do. But I want to just say thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll just throw it right out right away. Uh, our episodes are available on YouTube and Facebook, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis and facebook.com slash North Star Oasis. Because we got a lot of content today, we are going to go right on into the programming. Uh, first, we're going to look at our Prager University segment for today. Are some cultures better than others? It's a good question. Do you Let's think the, the United Nash States and Western say. Europe are made up of imperialist, colonialist, resource exploiting, greedy, grasping, brown skin hating people whose values are not worth defending? If you think this question is absurd and that no one thinks this way, you would be very much mistaken. Many people do. And what's even more disturbing, many of these people were born and live in the West. In other words, they've come to despise their own culture. This thinking is the product of a doctrine widely taught in our schools. It's known as multiculturalism, the belief that all cultures are equal. Or to put it another way, no culture's values, art, music, political system, or literature are better or worse than any other. But is this really true? Some years ago, Nobel Prize winning novelist Saul Bellow created a major controversy when he said, find me the Tolstoy of the Zulus or the Proust of the Papuans and I would be happy to read him. For this, Bellow was accused of racism. The charge was nonsense. Bellow wasn't saying that the Zulus and Papuans are incapable of producing great novelists. He was saying that as far as he knew, they hadn't. But just by raising the possibility that some cultures have contributed more than others, he violated the chief tenet of multiculturalism. More recently, President Donald Trump expressed a similar sentiment in Warsaw, Poland. We write symphonies, we pursue innovation, we treasure the rule of law and protect the right to free speech and free expression. We empower women as pillars of our society and of our success, that is, who we are. Those are the priceless ties that bind us together as a civilization. For this, Trump was roundly condemned by the multiculturalists. How could he say these things, one writer wrote, as if these were unique qualities to white-dominated nations instead of universal truths of the human race across all cultures? Here's the problem. Our values such as innovation, rule of law, free expression, and women's empowerment equally held across all cultures? If all cultures are equal, how does one account for the fact that for the past 500 years, it has been one culture, the culture of the West, and now of America, that has shaped the world? Multiculturalists explain it in terms of oppression. Western civilization, they say, became so powerful because it is so evil. The study of Western civilization, they insist, should focus on colonialism and slavery, the unique mechanisms of Western oppression. But colonialism and slavery are not uniquely Western at all. They are universal. The British conquered India and ruled it for 300 years. But before the British, the Persians, the Mongols, the Muslims, and Alexander the Great had done exactly the same thing, conquered large parts of India. Indeed, the British were the sixth or seventh colonial invader to occupy India. As for slavery, it has existed in every culture. It was prevalent in ancient China, in ancient India, in Greece and Rome, and in Africa. American Indians practiced slavery long before Columbus set foot here. What is uniquely Western, in fact, is not slavery, but the abolition of slavery. And what distinguishes the West from all other cultures are the institutions of democracy, capitalism, and science. These institutions developed because of a peculiar dynamism of Athens and Jerusalem, a synthesis of classical reason and Judeo-Christian morality. And it is these institutions, I believe, that comprise the source of Western strength and explain the West's long-standing dominance in the world. The West's greatest strength is not merely its military power, but also the unparalleled power of its ideas and institutions. But what about America? If America is a nation of immigrants, mostly non-white immigrants, doesn't that by definition make it a multicultural society? No. America is a multi-ethnic society. We don't want it to be a multicultural society. I'm an immigrant from India. 
My wife is an immigrant from Venezuela. Despite our differences of ethnic background, we have both assimilated to the unique values of America, the values embodied in our Constitution and our laws, the pursuit of happiness, the American dream. So, no, the United States and Western Europe are not made up of imperialist, colonialist, resource-exploiting, greedy, grasping, brown-skin-hating people. Our values are worth defending, not just because they are ours, but because they are good. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. And with the whole multicultural aspect, I will say, um, this is the stuff that is being taught into our colleges, especially our state-run institutions. I had to start dealing with this back in the early 1990s when I was a student at the University of Minnesota. And we got the multicultural class of the day, or class of the, uh, of the quarter. It was like multicultural dessert, du jour. Then I go up to St. Cloud State for graduate school, and guess what I got? Just about every class had to deal with race, class, or gender. Most of the programming had to deal with that. And that was, of course, in the history program. And yet, as was just stated, we are a multi-ethnic society, not necessarily a multicultural society. Herein lies the difference. Now, I'm going to lead, uh, lead that in because... Yes, I'm going to give you another hurricane episode today. I was not planning on it. This was not my intention. But with Hurricane Maria moving through Puerto Rico, and herein is the cultural tie that even though Puerto Rico is a uh, territory of the United States, it, is, it still has its own unique culture, that I felt that now it's time to actually turn the hurricane discussion into one important thing, and that is the relief efforts afterwards. We started off uh, two weeks ago discussing what is a hurricane, hurricane behavior, hurricane, uh, how, how, the, how scientists, the National Hurricane Center, get the data, how they acquire the data, and a little bit of predicting. Last week, we went more into covering how hurricanes are tracked and what the differences are in the European and the American GFS model. Now we're going to take a look uh, at the aftermath of a hurricane and the cleanup. Uh, but that, you, you, we'll be discussing that a little bit later. But right now, let's just get you up to speed into the current events. We're going to start off with Extreme Maria Puerto Rico footage. This is quite something to behold.
realmente no hay techo en madera así que se salve. Con la velocidad de los vientos. Definitivamente el ojo tiene que estar cerca. So that's what we saw in Puerto Rico, uh, I believe that was yesterday on uh, September 20th. Uh, that one hit, was the worst hurricane to ever hit Puerto Rico that I've heard of. Uh, it's probably not the worst, but maybe the worst in like the last 35 years or in recorded history. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, I've got friends of mine who live in Puerto Rico, so it's a little hairy situation when you hear that the power's out and it's going to be out for some time, for weeks or months. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that long. I think there's going to be some investment in Puerto Rico enough to get the lights back on and operational uh, far faster than the six month uh, period that the politicians are projecting right now. Uh, but it still could be a month or two and I hope I hear from my friends soon. In the meantime, there is an astronaut aboard the International Space Station who is from Puerto Rico and of course his family uh, you know, back uh, on the island has been affected by two hurricanes recently. So let's see what he has to say on an interview from the ISS. I had heard about uh, Maria, but haven't seen the track. And yeah, I do still have a lot of family there. Um, you know, my parents were born there, so a lot of relatives, cousins, godparents. But no, if it's happened in the last hour, I have not had a chance to talk to anybody. So I hope everyone's doing well and that you take care of yourselves. You know, it's kind of hard to believe, but uh, you know, you get so busy in the day working so hard that at times you forget to look out the window. So I'll be looking at our application that lets us know where we're going and hopefully we can uh, take a look and see if we can get some pictures for folks. Uh, personally, I had some problems with my house. It did flood. And so luckily there was an army of folks in the Houston area, um, a lot coming from the Johnson Space Center that helped clean out my house. Um, started yanking out walls and going through the drying process. So at the time of the hurricane, we were in Russia getting ready for our final exams. And it was a huge relief to know that there were people at home uh, taking care of me. So, um, you know, when you can help people out, it, it really means a lot. And so I personally know that. So that was uh, quite something to be in Russia and training while Hurricane Harvey pretty much barrels down your house and then you know, you're know you on the flight and all of a sudden Hurricane Maria comes through your uh, homeland. Anyhow, let's see what the Associated Press has to show for the aftermath of Hurricane Maria on Puerto Rico.
That's what the Associated Press uh, is showing for their video. Of course, the damage on the island is a lot more than what you'll be seeing on the nightly news if they're using the AP news feed. Uh, that looked to be pretty mild. I've actually seen as much destruction as that in some areas of Minneapolis after a uh, uh, thunderstorm. And it doesn't look bad, but actually it's a lot worse than what that little bit shows. Anyhow, we're going to go back a, almost a week in time. We're going to go to Saturday, September 16th. And leading into Hurricane Maria, this is what Joe Bastardi from Weather Bell has to say on his Saturday summary. And I think this one also may show a little bit about what we can expect with the upcoming uh, um, La Nina cycle. And if you think it's a really nice, gorgeous day, it's in the 80s, almost 90, it looks like summer out here today, it's not going to stay this way. And Joe Bastardi tells you why. Weatherbell Analytics, meteorologist Joe Bastardi with your Saturday summary this morning. Um, analoging the track of uh, Edouard, 1996. You see what I do here? I, I look at things and I say, boy, this looks like something I've seen before. Now, we had model runs that looked like Esther for a while, which is 1961. Model runs that looked like Doria, where it came back, and, or, or Hermine. But now uh, we, we're settling on this. But for the last week, folks, we have had the same forecast for next Wednesday night that this would be located. This, is, this goes back to last Saturday, near 40 north and 70 west for this, for this track. Now, this is our, this is the, uh, uh, the track that we have, uh, have now. This is the western edge of the window right here. See that right there? So the western edge of the window uh, possibilities keeps it offshore. The track is up the middle right here. And what I do is I increase this to a Category 3 storm uh, by Tuesday. And then it's a 1 on Wednesday, and there's that, four, see that see that spot there, 40 north and 70 west? Look what uh, the map looked like a week ago for the same, you see, say, going up here Monday and Wednesday, I was overdone on the intensity because it's weakened. Then back here uh, for Friday, that was supposed to be last night, so it's over here. A little bit too far west here, Sunday. Then Tuesday, and so it's, it's now located here Tuesday, and then for Thursday, I had it over the benchmark again. So when we look back, at, and it performed the loop and everything else, what I like to do is show our actual forecasts, not just computer models. And so um, the difference is that after coming out of this loop, this will be taking a, a path like this. But this forecast was made over a week ago and winding up at the same place. Um, here's the big problem. Yeah, I said yesterday that that depression's a throwaway, but 96L out in front is going to develop. And here's, here's the window that I have for it. You see the window to the south is bigger than the window to the north. And the big problem we have here is, you see it, see it still just a tropical storm tomorrow evening, a one for Tuesday. Between Tuesday and Thursday, it could rev up to a three before coming back down to a two. But this is on the other side of Puerto Rico now. So it's Puerto Rico Hispaniola. Remember, Irma went up here. And that's a problem because this water is very, very warm in here. And Irma left the water cooler up here. We then take it up just to the east of the Bahamas. And I'm sparing no, uh, nothing on the intensity this year. I felt very strongly that this was going to be a year where systems would be strong in the western Atlantic and to the west of 60 west. And so when I see something, I say, you know what, let's err on the side of, um, of uh, you know, more intensity. But when I say a four, it represents, well, on the low end, I can see a three, on the high end, a five. If it doesn't monkey around too much with Hispaniola. Now, uh, you see me way open to the west here toward Florida, because once this gets in here, it's just because it's here Monday doesn't mean it's assure. This could start monkeying around again. Or if it's here Monday, I don't, you know, so it is a big window. But we're, you know, we're talking here nine days away. So like Irma, we gave you a big, big heads up. And we jumped all over that system, even when it was just before it was named. Um, 
and we did that with Harvey too. So we're doing it with this. You know, we can look at the pattern and tell that this is likely to become another major impact player for the United States. Uh, again, this is a this is a throwaway uh, to me. If they name it, it's a waste of a name because it's going to weaken. And all the action—it's almost like Jose, Irma, Harvey, and this next thing are sucking all the wind out of the room uh, because it's so big. Uh, here's the sea surface temperatures along the eastern seaboard. And I point this out for two reasons. There's plenty of reason for this to intensify with the dynamics. The, we've got good outflow in there and the very warm water. But there is a wall of cold water waiting here that's going to chop the feed out from underneath this. These water temperatures go from being in the low to mid 80s to the low 70s here. And so a slow moving storm trying to come, come at New England, even if it was fairly far west, is not going to be able to make it in as a hurricane. Now that doesn't mean that we can't have hurricane conditions spread out way away from the storm center while the storm center weakens if it gets close enough. And there's still a chance that this just, just try to come up over Martha's Vineyard. But I look at this as a nor'easter and a big wave maker. And you know, you'll have some tidal flooding and beach erosion, but overall it's a miss for the United States. Now, you look at that sea surface temperature pattern and you notice that configuration and you remember what we said, that this is, a, this is what we said back in May, that we would get this kind of configuration, and this is the analog of the high impact seasons that we've had on the United States coast. And so before the season, before the season, we were actually predicting what the sea surface temperatures were going to look like, and the result was what you're seeing during the season. So when I hear it's for other reasons, uh, after setting the whole season up like this, I simply go back to what we said here at Weather Bell, that this is something that you could look at from the past. And if you did the, did the dirty work and set it up, if you're, say, uh, looking at the overall pattern, I think we're going to see this kind of sea surface temperature configuration, you would know you would have the high impact season, and that's why we forecasted that. Now, here is the area of red where I said over 50% of the ace was going to occur, and you can see how I had it spread out. And so we had Harvey go in here, we had Cindy go in here, we had Emily here, we had Irma in here, we had Gert out here, and you're going to see Edward come out in here, all right? And then you're going to have something try to come up in between the middle. Uh, Katia went down, Franklin was down here, we had three ham sandwiches down here, um, Harvey and Don, and uh, well, Harvey was just a ham sandwich here. Remember what happened with Harvey? Uh, it came all the way across and then intensified at the end over here. But my point is that with here, this this is not just an ace forecast. We were underdone on the ace, but what we gave people before the season with this, I, I mean, I I don't know I don't know uh, how I could do any better. You know, with Irma on here, and you saw Gert missed. Okay, and Edward is going to affect people and go out and. It's almost as if what's left is to come right up the middle to just prove our point. And, you know, there, there are issues I'm involved in that uh, people don't like. And the only way to prove I'm right is by being right. And with our hurricane forecast, we have been researching impact more so than totality of season as far as the number of storms and all that. I, I, you know, I, really, I don't really care about eyesores near the Azores. I mean, I know it, uh, you know, people love to look at it and everything else. I care about what's going to impact the areas of the United States and the islands because we've got clients in here. And you can see this, this warning shot across the bow was issued before the season based on sound meteorological principles and not based on any of the mumbo jumbo I hear today. After a storm occurs, people come out and tell me it's a different reason. But why would I, why would I not defend what I worked on and put out before the fact. So, you know, that's, that's all this is. So, I mean, you can say what you want to say, but you, you have all these tracks in here, <laughs> gird out here, most of the action, in fact, 75% of the ACE this year is right in that area. And this only covers, this covers less than, uh, this covers about 25% of the total area of the ocean where the ACE can be scored. So that's a pretty significant forecast right there. Now, let's jump to winter. The winter's coming up, and we've got our winter forecast out. I want to show it to you. Uh, this was a forecast uh, from six months ago for sea surface temperature profiles. In the defense of CFSV2, it was ahead of the game. 
as far as hinting at a La Nina. And this is what its forecast looks like now. So you can see that uh, quite a bit of difference there uh, with the uh, La Nina look uh, for the upcoming three months. And here's what it looks like for the winter. So there's not much question that uh, a La Nina is on the way. Uh, we've got the European, and this is off its public site, saying a La Nina is on the way. And uh, it's a pretty significant looking La Nina overall. Here's the uh, forecast for the uh, anomalies at uh, ENSO 3.4. And uh, here's, the, uh, here's the European now, and vastly different from what it was a couple months ago uh, with this. So the CFSV2, in my book, scored the coup. So uh, here's what our temperatures look like for the upcoming winter. And you can see uh, we're a bit above normal here and a below normal here. And what I'm trying to guard against is the extremities and the volatility of the pattern. Uh, the back and forth that can take place in this. And I think you're going to see some outstanding cold shots this year, but also warm ups between them, more so than what you may uh, normally associate with winter. So uh, I don't want people to think that this is a oh, la di da. For instance, the month of September, <laughs> the way it's going, when it's all said and done, it may be pretty close to normal across the United States, but the way they got there is pretty wild. And this kind of pattern with a lot of back and forth produces a lot of precipitation in here. There's a lot of precipitation. There will be events where there's plenty of snow and ice. And you can see us with above normal in this area and again in the Pacific Northwest. This is sort of a throwaway here. I mean, if it doesn't snow in the Southwest, who cares if you say it's below normal snowfall? I'm not sure how the Southeast is going to work out because there may be one or two renegade systems in spite of a warm winter down there. Um, here's the month so far. And with it getting darn cold in the West and warm in the East, like I said, you might have a September, then you're like, yeah, that September was near normal. It's anything but normal. You know, uh, uh, no, let's put it this way. Normals are a product of the swings, and there's some big swings this year. Here's the CFSV2, the upcoming five days. You can see how very cold it is in the west, warm in the east, and uh, it continues that way in the 6 to 10. So, uh, And, of course, with it being warm here, amplitude, whether cold or warm, breeds trouble underneath, and the tropics will be trouble, as we've alluded to. Right now, uh, taking a look at the bigger picture, the Earth is at its second warmest in the last 35 years for the month of September is CFSR. So it's very warm September still, okay? Uh, you know, there was a lot of speculation that we were going to have record low sea ice this year. That didn't happen, obviously. Then again, with the mean being up here, this is nothing to brag about, but it's still not, uh, still not where we hear the hysteria. Uh, in the early part of the season about that. And here's the North Pole temperatures. You can see they stayed below normal much of the time this summer as they've been prone to do. And uh, already as we go into the colder season, you see it lagging a bit above normal. All right, we've talked this, over this a thousand times, so we're not going to make it a thousand and one. What we will make, what we will say, we've said this infinitely, and we'll say it infinitely plus one, enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. So that was Joe Bastardi from Weatherbell, and I hope there's, there's really two things I hope you got out of that, uh, unrelated hurricanes. One, pay attention to the 133% above normal for snowfall because of La Nina. That is traditionally what happens is we get an above average snowfall. And El Nino gives us mild, mild winters, La Nina gives us more severe snowfall in winter. Uh, so that's what the pattern we're going into. The other one is, that was done five days ago. And what did his five-day GFS V2 outlook have to say? That we are going to be in a, in Minnesota, is going to be in a warming trend. It's going to really warm up here. And guess what? In the last couple of days, it's been up in the 80s, feeling like it should be July, uh, but looking like it should be October. So th this is normal but not normal but Bastardi explains it and I'm really thankful that we've got a guy like Joe Bastardi around to teach us uh, some of this material so now we're gonna see what he actually had to say today five days after he made that forecast let's see what he has to say for today's daily update Right about analytics, meteorologist Joe Bastardi well today's the anniversary of the 1938 hurricane in New England could be the uh, freakiest event that's ever occurred in the United States out of the tropics. We can argue over that, but to see 186 mile an hour wind gusts with a sustained wind of 100, uh, 
21 miles an hour for five minutes, even if it is at 600 feet of Blue Hill, Massachusetts, is just almost incomprehensible to me. If I hadn't seen this, I wouldn't believe it could even happen. Here's some pictures, and this is out of, uh, you know, Google 1938 hurricane. And so when you look at the events that are happening now, and you understand what happened before, you understand that the weather, the averages of the weather are a product of the weather going to extremes, and at times it's normal for the weather to go to extremes. For instance, uh, when you look at what's going on in the Pacific right now, it's very, very quiet. When the Pacific was acting up, the Atlantic was down, the Pacific shut down, the Atlantic picked up. Uh, here's a picture of Providence, Rhode Island, under 13 feet of water. Oh, the red card, this is, this is uh, further, further back away from the downtown area here. You can see that car is submerged over there. Uh, just you know, more pictures of utter devastation. Uh, on the New England coast on this day in 1938. Uh, this is Jose, and of course, Jose is a good example of weather because it weakened. The 38 hurricane came along today. That would be climate change. But there's Jose weakening off New England. And um, here's the tracks of Jose. Uh, many of them are back to the west. This is going to be crucial. If Jose just stays out here and gradually weakens, then Maria is going to head toward it. If this comes back to the west and you see Maria come in here and try to come in close, and that's what our uh, forecasted track is going to say with that. This is Maria. Notice how big the eye is. It is not, it, it filled exactly what I said, 50, 40 to 50 millibars yesterday. Hasn't gotten it back yet. Remember what happens. The inner eye gets hollowed out. So now you have a, a wider eye. And so because the air can't spin in as much, it doesn't come in um, as strongly. So the wind is not as high. Um, our track takes it up to a Category 4 hurricane. Off the Outer Banks on Tuesday, windows open to the west because if Jose comes back to the west, it could get in here and try to turn northwest. If Jose stays out here, it will probably head toward Jose. Jose is a huge linchpin because the overall pattern with the big ridge of high pressure in the means over eastern North America is the kind of pattern that favors hurricanes hitting on the United States coast. I call it a ridge over troubled waters. But Jose being in the way is gumming up the works. So you can see the spray of tracks. There's one right up the middle here, a bunch to the east where you see a lot of folks uh, taking that. I'm taking the more, the more westerly bend because I feel that this ridge is likely to be stronger out here. And this ridge to the north is liable to deflect Jose to the west. There so are a lot of moving parts here. A lot of moving parts. So to me, it's not a done deal. Now, to God bless them if they're right. This goes out. Remember, we had Irma was supposed to go up into here, and it wound up over here. And we had Jose last week was supposed to wind up over here, and it wound up here. So, uh, you know, if they're right, they're right. So, But right now, uh, we are where we are. Uh, I like the idea that's going to try to use this warm plume of water to move along here. And uh, you can see Jose ran into this cooler plume, although it has warmed up relative to normal over the past uh, several days. Uh, these are the U.S. tracks, the consensus, as you can see, off to the east. So the U.S. models are heavily eastward biased, and no, they may be right. I just have my opinion on it. Um, and uh, here's a spray of the European ensembles. We're all, it's got all the different lows, so it calculates a mean, but you can see a bunch still off to the west, as many as to the west as they are to the east. And finally, we have this feature that's here, and I don't anticipate that developing uh, for quite for quite a while. However, if we go back to the uh, picture of Maria I showed you, where is that? There we are. Uh, you see this? See that circle? I'm expecting a development in week two right over here. And I'll tell you what, uh, I, I tell you the Japanese model uh, looks like it's definitely seeing that. Let me see if I can eliminate this and put this put this on for you over here. I got to do a lot of magic over here to get this. Uh, let's see. There's a track of Maria and... Uh, Okay, let me get that off. Look at the Japanese model, week two, seeing all that precipitation and then <laughs> and making a point this way. So once, once we get by here with uh, Maria, we're going to have to look in the Western Caribbean to see where the next one's coming from. Big flip in the pattern coming. It's gotten very cold here, very warm here. Down the road, week two, we're going to see the cool come back out over the top here, the warmth in here, and we'll have to look south to see if we're going to get any development. I'll tell you what, these daily summaries have been running real long for the last month, and there's a good reason. It's been a lot of weather going on. Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. And there you have it. That's bringing you up to date as of September 21st. 
That's kind of the weather situation, hurricane situation, courtesy of Joe Bastardi from Weather Bell Analytics. So now, here we are talking about what's going to happen with the next cycles, but now let's go back and take a look at what's happening in the aftermath of Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. Um, how's the cleanup going? What relief agencies are doing the best work? What kind of work are they doing? First of all, we're going to start actually with a Houston City Council member who is not happy with the City of New Orleans or the Red Cross. And the Red Cross has come under a lot of fire lately for their handling of hurricane relief efforts. And this is actually nothing new. It's actually been something going on for a while. But I want you to hear it from a Houston City Council member. This is the area directly impacted by Hurricane Harvey. And this is a person trying to represent his people in the cleanup. And I don't know what his political affiliation is, Republican, Democrat, I don't know, I don't care. What he has to say is quite shocking. Let's take a look. Councilmember Martin. And thank you, Mayor. As, uh, as many people know, uh, I'm a native New Orleanian, and I experienced Katrina in 2005. And comparing and contrasting the leadership of both of those hurricanes, which are tragic events, is like night and day. Uh, what you and your team have done has been extraordinary. And I do believe that, Mayor, and I've told you this before, and I've said it publicly, that I'm sure it was tough when you lost those previous mayoral races, but I know that the good Lord had a plan for you that we didn't understand back then that we understand today. When we look at your leadership and what you're doing in our city today, and uh, he put you at this point in time in this role for a reason, and, and great job. We just all need to experience a little bit of patience because it's going to be a long, long, long process. And Kingwood probably half of the neighborhood took on water and we can't get to the people's houses as quickly as we'd all like to. The problem we have is we have the, the San Antonio guys that are busting their tails right now in our area. But when you fill up a truck and you go to the landfill, it takes you two hours from the time you fill up the truck till the time the truck returns to the neighborhood and it kills us. There are cars parked in streets where the trucks can't get through and that kills us. So patience is a virtue, and we need to make sure that we all address that. You know, speaking of New Orleans, um, I got a little ticked off yesterday, so I called the mayor of New Orleans' office. Couldn't get through to him. Left my message, and he never called me back. <coughs> no one was better to the city of New Orleans than the city of Houston. And to everyone in his, that lives in this city from New Orleans, I ask you, where in the hell is New Orleans? Where are they with their trucks? Where are they with any equipment that we sent over to them in 2005 and we busted our tail for them? Where are they? I find it highly unusual, ironic, depressing as a New Orleanian to watch the city of New Orleans give us not a damn thing. Pardon my ignorance, pardon my French. And it really ticks me off, and that's my hometown. Always be part of me, but um, it really makes me mad because the response from New Orleans has been zero. Council, so, let me, let me, before you leave, because let, me, let me just say this, um, because uh, the mayor of New Orleans, Mitchell Andrew, did, did, did um, uh, organize a conference call uh, with uh, 76 other mayors on it um, on last week, and, and he did do that. He did initiate that, and that there are a number of supplies that are flowing in from across the country uh, as a result, uh, from Boston to Colorado. Um, I just want, don't even want to start naming Columbia, South Carolina, um, I mean, from all over the country. Yep. So I, I do want to give him special credit uh, for uh, organizing uh, those mayors from all over the country, asking for uh, them to contribute supplies and and he said, whatever, whatever we need, that they will provide. So I, well, I do. I, I and, and you didn't, you yeah. didn't have that information. I, I appreciate so their so. conference call. I went to school with Mitch Landrew. And uh, send me your darn trucks, Mitch. I hope you're listening. Um, you know, in, in regards to the San Antonio folks, um, they're busting their tail out there. They get to Kingwood around 6 in the morning. They don't leave till it's dark at night. And I can't say enough good things about those folks in San Antonio that are doing a great job. Now, my last rant will be on the Red Lost. I'm sorry, the Red Cross. Because the Red Cross, if anybody wants to donate to the Red Cross, please call me. I beg you not to send them a penny. 
They are the most inept, unorganized organization that I've ever experienced. I, I've been in Kingwood fighting this thing, and we have not seen one person, not a single person from the Red Lost. Yet, every time I turn on the TV, they're receiving multi, multi hundreds of millions of dollars. What are you guys doing with it? How many contractors are you helping us with? So to this day, many days after the hurricane hit, I have not seen a single person in Kingwood or in Clear Lake that's a representative of the Red Cross. You know who opened our shelters? We did. You know who sent water and supplies? We did. People didn't have cots. We got them blankets. We didn't get a darn thing from the Red Cross. <laughs> so if anybody wants to send them money, don't waste your time, don't waste your money. Send it to other causes. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, thanks, Councilman Martin. Uh, Councilmember Kubash. I wanted to make sure that you heard from somebody in a position of authority in Houston that this isn't some conspiracy theory or some anti-Red Cross. I wanted to make sure that if you're thinking about donating to Red Cross, think again, but hear it from somebody in Houston. My words are irrelevant because I'm not dealing with a hurricane or natural disaster. But the people who are affected, who need the help, who need the organization, are not necessarily getting it from the Red Cross. And I've actually heard this for many, many, many years. This is not the first time. The uh, relief to Haiti for their earthquake a couple of years ago, they had received half of a, uh, half, was it half of 500 million, I think? And yet 25% of that was spent on salaries and administrative fees. And a lot of the other money just went to other agencies, but there's no accountability in where the money actually got to where, you know, to help the most people. It was supposed to be promised for building a lot of housing units, and only six units were built. You can't tell me in Haiti that half of a billion dollars can build more, cannot build more than six homes. Something's not right there. And personally, I think it just happens to be that the Red Cross is too large and it's gotten away from the original mission of uh, Clara Barton. It's got a lot of bloated bureaucracy to it. But I wanted to show you two organizations that are doing a great job that if you do want to help in hurricane relief, these are organizations you might want to consider supporting. Uh, again, I'm not telling you to do this. If you want to make a contribution to the Red Cross, I'm not going to tell you not to, other than I think that these might be better organizations in the long term. So first of all, we're going to take a look at Samaritan's Person, what they're doing in Texas uh, after Hurricane Harvey. This is the worst we've ever seen. The, the destruction is so widespread. And no one has seen this much water. Uh, we've seen the wind damage like in Rockport, but the, the rain event that took place to the east through Houston and over into Louisiana, that's never happened in the history of the United States. People's homes are gone. People are living in their cars. Their roofs are gone. They need people to come down here and um, do. We lost uh, electricity and water. All our food is gone. We slept three days outside. We need all the help we can get. My prayer for this community right now, a healing. We think we're in the middle of this storm all alone. God is here. God's mercy, God's grace is here and it is being put on the ground here through Samaritan's Purse to go out into our community and tell them not only we're here to help things get better, but we hope you know that God loves you. Samaritan's Purse is the organization that gratefully is uh, helping my wife and I and our neighbors. I, I guess there's what, 30 or 40 volunteers here? Trucks, chainsaws, rakes. Bull and I are gonna volunteer uh, start next week once we get our lives somewhat back in order. Anything I can do to be the hands and feet of Jesus, man, I'm, you can count me in. Eleven of us came from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Drove 13 hours straight over here to come help some people out, man. 
I heard someone was here from Spain. <laughs> I hear, heard a lady was here from Pennsylvania. It just shows them that they're not alone through this crisis. I'm Jose Gutierrez. I am 90 years old, and I hope I get younger. <laughs> Broken to everything, all the trees and everything. My dad is like my my hero because I've seen him go through a lot of stuff throughout his life. He was doing two full-time jobs at one time, taking care of work and pastoring at the same time. So most of this house, you know, my dad and my grandpa, you know, built his house. All this was contaminated with uh, mold and the moisture. The tree that was on this side fell on that and it punctured a hole on that, on that roof over there. We were getting out our tools, getting ready to start doing what we could. And then the Samaritan first people started coming in. They said a prayer before we did anything. Father, I ask that you would, in many, many ways, show your love and kindness. That really touched, touched my heart, because that's, that's what it's all about. Samaritan Park people tarp, tarped it all up for us. They removed all the all the chi rock. But what Samaritan Purse did for us in eight hours, it would have taken us at least three months to do. The advice to them is just thank God for everything. Our commitment will be in South Texas probably for the next two years. There's, there's nothing that we can do that fixes everything immediately. It just takes time, but it takes an army of volunteers, and that's what we really need is volunteers. Men and women who are willing to come from across the country, come down here for a week. Come down here for a weekend. Come down for a day. Come down for a month. Whatever you can, uh, come, because we can certainly use you and put you to work. You know, they took time out of their lives to help us, you know, complete strangers. And that's that's rare. Samaritan Purse people are, are beautiful, they're nice, they're gifted, they're blessed by God. So that's the work that Samaritan's Purse is doing in Texas to help in Hurricane Harvey relief efforts. And I already, I mean, it's been less than a month, and they're already just doing a bang-up job down there. But there's another organization I want to highlight today, and that is Habitat for Humanity. Let's see what they're doing in Victoria, Texas, after Hurricane Harvey. The damages to the community at large were substantial. We had no electrical infrastructure. We lost potable water. The Rio Grande Valley affiliate reached out to us almost immediately and said, look, we understand that you guys need water. You don't have any potable water. I can get water to you. We're about three hours south of here, and when the storm missed us, we knew we had to respond. We mobilized our volunteers. We united the community. And then as soon as the storm passed, we mobilized and we responded. As of this moment, we have transported 166 pallets of relief material to the communities of Victoria, Corpus, and Beaumont, Texas. When we talk about Habitat for Humanity, we recognize that we're more than just an organization, we're a community, and we're a family. And I believe that if one family member is suffering, then we're all suffering, and we need to come together to lift each other up. We can move mountains as a group. Uh, we can accomplish great things, partnering together, working together to help more families. Habitat for Humanity also went to Florida in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. Let's check it out. Where would you like it? We've got four different nonprofits or organizations that are joining together today for one cause, and that's to help people that have been impacted by Hurricane Irma. We had an emergency operations center meeting yesterday with all the long-term recovery groups. And one of the things that they said that we had that nobody else had was we had the capacity to be able to host distribution channels for semis to come in. We have a forklift, we have other materials, and we have staff and volunteers. The unmet needs are really immediate needs for water, for housing, for food, 
People talking about division, division, division. Uh, this is unity. This is what it looks like. This is the way it works. It's a community helping each other so that uh, they're all helped together. We are uniquely positioned because we know the community, the community knows us, and, and we can do more together. And when we join forces with other nonprofits, we can leverage all of the resources that we have, and then we can say, what's the best of everything that we can provide? What I hope happens from this is that it stirs people to action, not just in the midst of a hurricane, but it stirs people to action in the midst of their everyday life. And let's see what Samaritan's Purse did in Florida after Hurricane Irma. We're here responding to Hurricane Irma in Florida, and we're seeing lots of devastation with flooded out houses. We're here for the people of Florida and uh, assessing the situation, trying to get help here for these people. I grew up in Florida my whole life, and these people are dealing with major flooding right now lots of trees on their houses. Uh, some things are completely gone, only shells of houses left. So many of these people can't afford to get the help they need. We're here to uh, lighten people's burden. They have heavy hearts. We've seen uh, men and women holding hands, walking down the street crying, because uh, everything they have is missing, or there's trees through their house. And we're here in Jesus' name. Please pray for the people who have been affected by Hurricane Irma in Florida. We need your prayers and support, and we wouldn't be able to do this without you. So both organizations that I highlighted are doing a fabulous job. They really, really are, and that's the reason I want to highlight them. There are, I mean, we hear so much about the Red Cross, and again, they, have a, they serve a purpose, but we hear so much about the Red Cross that unfortunately other organizations that are probably doing better work down there, they don't get quite the exposure that the Red Cross does. How many athletes do you see out there making a TV appeal to say, help us with Samaritan's Purse? Where are the movie stars coming out and saying, Habitat for Humanity needs your help to help people in a hurricane-affected area? Where is the Hollywood elite donating you know, tens of thousands or, or millions of dollars to Habitat for Humanity or Samaritan's Purse? They're not there, but they'll do that for the Red Cross because the Red Cross has the much better organized PR machine. But people in the hurricane-affected areas are hurting, and they need help. They need assistance. I'm glad to know that there are other organizations that are out there helping them. Uh, again, with, blood, uh, with the blood donations, blood banks, Red Cross does a phenomenal job. But in disaster relief, they may have been the top dogs 20 or 30 years ago when there were you know, there was, the need wasn't quite as great because the infrastructure in these areas wasn't like it is now. But now there's actually competition for resources. There's other organizations doing the same type of work. They're doing it better. And those are the types of organizations that I like to support. I would like to see more people getting helped with every dollar that's spent. Instead of 25 cents on the dollar going to administrative fees, why can't it be 15 cents or 10 cents, especially when you're dealing with the money that the American Red Cross is? I don't have the time right now in the interest of this show of going up to Charity Navigator and actually comparing these organizations on their efficiencies, but I will tell you that, um, that those, the two that I highlighted, Samaritan's Purse and... Uh, Habitat for Humanity, they have a lot less administrative expense than the American Red Cross. Now we are going to actually leave here with our uh, musical number for today, which of course is going to be a rain theme. So um, you know, I'm going to I'm just giving a heads up to my producer to make sure he can set that up. We do have about another um, minute or so that I can discuss. So what I'm what I'm saying here is that. There are other options besides one big organization. There's actually an organization called the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, the NVOAD.org. Um, there, there's on, on their stuff uh, on their webpage. There's um, a Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria uh, page. 
Uh, they do have the Red Cross listed here, but they also have other organizations that can help in these needs. Anyhow, we're going to go to uh, Keith Whitley, the late Keith Whitley. I remember when he was still alive, I was still growing up, and he had a great song called I'm No Stranger to the Rain. And considering that we have organizations like this that are uh, working so hard and disaster after disaster, they're not strangers to the rain either. I'm no stranger to the rain. I'm a friend of thunder, a friend is it any wonder lightning strikes me? I fought with the devil, got down on his level, but I never gave him something he told me. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching. Reminding you, we have 94 shopping days left until Christmas, and we will see you next week.